For some reason, he pulled the vehicle forward, got out, walked around back, moved the boom around to the front of the truck, and when he let it down, he let it down on 7,200 volts, which fed through the truck, through the tires to him, and he ended up laying on the ground some 15 feet away from the truck. When we go to hire somebody, we, we run them through uh, what type of boots they should wear, uh, long pants, uh, don't wear jewelry, uh, especially working on electrical panels. It was always a thing for me to, to take my wedding ring off. It's uh, just something you don't want to do, uh, is, and it can happen really easily. Is stick your hand in an electrical panel and arc across a bus bar or, or something like that. Um, it's the smallest of things that kind of jump out and bite you. If, if it only takes a second to occur, then it's, it's worth taking a, a few minutes to make a phone call. Again, the job's not that important, that it cannot wait until you've had a proper locate accomplished. We're talking about people who are standing on the ground with a saw, and there's wires up there, but they're, my, they're hundreds of feet away. And if you've got a faulty ground and touch something here, you've created a path, mister, I'm telling you what, it, it's, it's lights out. Regardless of your construction trade, there are three things that we all have in common. We want to do a good job, we want to earn a good wage, and we want to go home at the end of the day. But every year, construction workers who come into contact with underground and overhead electrical lines will not go home. Others will be injured so severely that they'll face long periods of disability and unemployment, not to mention pain and suffering. If that's not enough to get your attention, consider the fact that almost all of these accidents can be prevented by learning and following a few basic safety guidelines. If you're working on a project that requires that you dig or trench in any way, call in a utility locate. Knowing where underground lines are buried before each digging project helps protect you from injury, expense, and penalties. Most areas have a one-call system that allows you to request the location of multiple utilities with a single call. The nationwide Call Before You Dig number is 811. By calling 811, you will be automatically routed to the one-call agency in your state. It is important to note that in some remote areas, 811 may not work, so please continue to use the toll-free number for your state that is often listed in the front of your local phone book. These one-call locate services require that you call for a locate no less than three business days before you intend to break ground. Once notified, they'll advise all utilities operating in the project area of your start date, and each utility will have three business days to locate and mark their lines within the area you've specified. Keep in mind that most locates are good for 10 days after your reported start date. And if your work does not begin within that period, you may have to call for a relocate just to be sure no new lines were buried after the original locate order. Each utility that serves the designated area is responsible for marking the location of their lines or providing notice if the area is clear of their utility. This all clear notice may come in the form of a fax, an automated call, a written all clear notice, or even a mark on site that indicates that the utility has checked the designated area. In other words, if you arrive on site and do not see markers for your electrical utilities, for example, and did not receive an all-clear notice, do not assume that there are no electric utilities in the area. A simple call to your locate center will either confirm an all-clear or expedite a locate order. If you dig that into the wires, it's going to short the wires out, short the shovel out. If you're lucky and you're using an insulated tool, then you probably won't even receive a shock and just burn a hole in the other tool in the wires. We don't ever do a job without calling locates in. It's just, it's an unwritten but written law that we and our company uh, proceed according to the way we should and call under, or underground locates in before we even stick a shovel on the ground. 
you'll find your utility providers pretty accommodating when it comes to completing their site checks within the designated period, but believe me, it's much more important that you know where buried lines lie because any contact you make with those lines could have consequences that are far worse than repair bills and fines. Now, if you do come into contact with an underground power line, you're going to know it. And we'll go over how to provide first aid to victims of electric shock in just a few minutes. But what if you discover a line and you're not sure if it's live? Bottom line, assume it is and stop what you're doing until you can determine what you're dealing with by calling the utility to identify and disconnect the power if needed. And that is our goal primarily is to make sure everybody goes home at night and everything's done properly. One other note, very few locate services will mark lines that have been buried by home or property owners, such as lines to outdoor landscape lighting or yard lights, for example. That's no different than asking the electric company to locate gas lines or underground television cable. The point is, there may be other underground electric lines in your work area, so it's always wise to assess the area in which you're about to dig and proceed with caution. We actually received 7,200 volts, which is three times the electric chair. It passed through his body from his fingers to his toes and received just minor injuries, which could have been fatal. It should go without saying that when working around overhead lines, it pays to be alert. The truth is, most of the people who come into contact with overhead lines never actually touch the lines themselves. They make contact with ladders, tools, or the booms or cranes or buckets of the work vehicles while their attention is focused on what's happening down here on the ground. Most often, it's accidental, but sometimes workers come into contact with lines because they have a false sense of safety that comes from the assumption that overhead lines are insulated in some way. They're not. While some overhead lines are coated, what you're seeing is actually a weatherproofing material that has no insulating qualities. And since metal ladders, tools, truck buckets, and even the human body are all excellent conductors of electricity, that electrical current will follow the path of least resistance to the ground. And that includes moving through you. In other words, touching an overhead line, whether with your hand or a piece of equipment, is essentially like grabbing the bare ends of an electrical cord that's plugged into a wall. And no one in their right mind would think of doing that. In fact, just one amp or the power needed to run an electric mixer can stop a human heart. So when you compare that to the current coursing through overhead lines, well, you get the picture. Another misconception that many people have is that at the first sign of electric shock, you can just pull your hand away or let go of whatever you're holding that's made contact with the electric line. But the truth is, that will occur at only very small current levels. At higher current levels, Electricity coursing through tissue will cause muscles to contract. In other words, your hand will most likely reflexively tighten around the handle of that shovel or that power line like a vice. Be careful. Uh, you just don't know. The simplest of things can really jump out and bite you. Uh, you're messing with 120, sometimes 240 volts. Um, and just the slightest move and uh, slightest wrong move could be a major catastrophe. Even if you could let go, with electricity traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, face it, you're not fast enough. Unfortunately, few people have actually lived to tell what it's like, and those that are fortunate enough to be blown off their feet and thrown away from danger with only severe burns, neurological damage, and permanent disabilities often don't remember much about the experience. A number of people I have heard say uh, that they didn't realize the line was that close. And, and, and if you have to ask yourself if the line is, is too close, then chances are you're too close. When it comes to working around overhead lines, it's best to assume not only that the lines are live, but that they are also high voltage. There is a minimum safe distance of 10 feet, which should be maintained when working near energized power facilities. The minimum safe distance will increase, however, 
as the voltage increases. Safe distances can also be affected by weather conditions and other factors. If you know that the lines are carrying lower voltages, say 50,000 volts, the minimum safe distance is 10 feet. And even then, be sure that neither you nor your equipment or vehicle lifts breach that barrier. Unfortunately, people who are operating lift trucks, cherry pickers, or cranes don't always have a clean line of sight overhead, leaving anyone working in the bucket and the operators themselves in a vulnerable position. To be absolutely sure that you don't cross into the danger zone, it's critical that you designate someone to stand within the line of sight of the bucket or crane operator to spot you as you move equipment into position wherever overhead lines are present. And if your work requires that you continue hoisting, booming, or traveling within that area, keep your spotter in position until you are stationary. That individual is your greatest safety device. Do not rely on proximity warning devices, hook insulators, insulating boom guards or cages, swing limit stops, ground rods, or any protective devices because every one of them has limits and any one of them can fail. And if by some terrible chance you're in a vehicle that makes contact with an overhead line and you survive, it's important to know that the metal cab is an electrical conductor, so anyone close to or touching the cab becomes the path of least resistance to ground. That means people outside of a vehicle can be severely injured or even killed if they're touching the vehicle when it makes contact. And you can be injured or killed trying to exit if your vehicle remains in contact. In fact, even people in close proximity can be injured or killed depending on whether the soil they're standing on is conductive enough. Also, keep in mind that sometimes even the 10 or 12 foot rule is not enough. The greater the span of the electrical lines from one pole to another, the more likely they are to swing in high winds. What was originally a 10 or 12 foot safety barrier could become significantly less if the wind is causing lines to swing. So, take wind and weather conditions into account whenever you're working near overhead lines and increase the safe working distance as needed to maintain at least the specified 10 to 12 foot distance at all times. Well, with our job, we have people that help us, watch us from the ground, a spotter, as you say, and um, their job is to make sure that we don't do something wrong. You can't obviously see everything. You have everything covered up when you're working, but still there's a chance something could happen and he's there to just help you along to oversee what you're doing and to make sure that you do it safely. Now hopefully you'll never experience an electrical incident, but if you do, there are a few other things you should know to avoid making the situation even worse. Always assume that a fallen power line is energized or live. Don't touch it. Don't attempt to move it even with a tool that you believe to be non-conductive. Down lines are not only deceivingly unpredictable, but you never know when a deadline might suddenly be activated by crews working on other lines. So just stay away and warn others to stay away while you contact the power company. When it comes to uh, uh, wires falling down on equipment, on vehicles, you, um, you have to stay clear. Uh, you can't put yourself at risk. Uh, you know, if, if the person's hurt in, inside the car, you know, you, you, I mean, you wouldn't go into a burning home and, and, and assume the risk and just to see if someone's in there or if you knew somebody was in there. Uh, you've got to protect yourself, you know, rather than having, I hate to say it, but one fatality. I mean, why would you want three? If one of your vehicles comes into contact with a power line, be sure the operator remains inside the vehicle and does not make contact with the metal exterior in any way until you are absolutely sure the lines are de-energized. Again, if the operator attempts to exit the vehicle, he or she could become the path of least resistance for the electricity that is traveling across the vehicle's exterior to reach ground. That's also why no one outside the vehicle should attempt to enter it until the electricity feeding the lines is cut by the power company. About um, three months ago, we had a guy that uh, was raining, storming, and uh, he literally backed into one of the poles transformer came down on top of our truck uh, he was okay didn't get out of the truck called police or called fire department they in turn called the power company and it was ironically AP they came out and uh, removed the transformer I just know that 
at that point, you, if you try to exit the vehicle, once you step on the ground, you become energized, and, and that can often result in a, a fatal incident. Now, what if the vehicle that makes contact catches fire? That's a bad thing. There is a way to exit the vehicle, but it should be attempted only as a last resort because it carries its own risk. Bottom line, exiting a vehicle that is electrically charged requires that you never touch both the vehicle and the ground at the same time. In other words, you should exit by jumping clear of the vehicle while keeping both feet together so they both hit the ground at the same time. If you were to take a full step, you could be exposed to a hazardous difference in potential between your feet. In fact, the best way to move away from the danger zone at that point is to shuffle using very small sliding steps until you have reached an area where you are certain you have reached a safe area. And if you find yourself in a situation where someone has come into contact with electricity, your team's training in basic first aid and CPR can mean the difference between life and death for a member of your team or even you. But before attempting to deliver aid, be sure the victim is no longer in contact with and a safe distance away from the electrical source. Touching a victim who is still in contact with electricity means that you become the new path to ground and potentially another victim. Once it's safe to give aid, training in resuscitation breathing and chest compressions can keep someone alive long enough for medics to arrive. The bottom line is, all the rules that are in place and, and all the procedures that are in place, if you don't follow them, you're just setting yourself up and asking for trouble. As you can imagine, accidents involving underground and overhead power lines receive the most attention because they have the most dramatic results. But the truth is, accidents involving electricity and power tools are far more common and can have equally devastating effects. They can kill you. So it only makes sense that we offer a few suggestions here to try to keep you safe when using electric power tools. Of course, most of the safety tips you've heard before and many are common sense. So why is it that hundreds of people are injured every year because of problems with power tools that result in electrical shock? Again, there's this sense of security that we can handle a little shock and that it's not that bad. Well, that's not necessarily so. Typically anything that is, doesn't look safe to you, don't use it. What should you know when it comes to working with electric power tools? Obvious rule number one. Keep the power tool free of dirt, oil, and grime that can cause them to overheat and short out. They can become a shock hazard and a fire hazard. Obvious rule number two. If you're using a power cord, be sure its amperage rating is equal to or greater than that of the tool you're using. Both the equipment and the power or extension cord have ratings right on the label that will help you determine whether they're compatible. Regardless, if the cord you're using becomes excessively warm or hot, if you smell burning plastic or hot metal, or if you notice smoke or sparks, there's a good chance your cord is not up to par or it's damaged in a way that requires repair or replacement. Obvious rule number three. If there are breaks or cuts in the cord or you're working with a loose plug, either repair or replace the cord right away. Obvious rule number four. Equipment and power cords have a ground wire to provide a safe path to the ground in case of a short circuit. Never remove the ground prong and never use a cord that has had its ground prong damaged or removed. Technically, we have to throw away cords that, are, that do have the grounds cut off. Um, OSHA requires that you have power, all power tools, cords, uh, any type of electrical tool that we use has to be grounded. Uh, if it is not, it's junk. Uh, we can't replace the caps on the end of the cords. They're no longer OSHA compliant. We have to throw them away. In fact, you might also want to consider using double insulated power tools for added protection. A lot of tools today are double insulated. If you don't have a double insulated tool and it has a third prong on there for the ground, a lot of old homes don't have the three prong connector in the recepts. And I've seen a lot of people cut those off and uh, so they can plug in a, a tool or an appliance and, and, and they're really creating a safety hazard for, for themselves. Obvious rule number five, consider your surroundings when working with electric power tools. If there's standing water in your work area, if it's raining, or if there's any chance that you or your tools will come into contact with liquids, 
move to a drier, safer area. And a ground fault circuit interrupter, or GFCI, should be used in all wet locations. And obvious rule number six, whenever you're working with electrical equipment and you notice malfunctions, strange odors, or sparks of any kind, stop. Assess the condition of your equipment and power cords and repair or replace them before proceeding. It's just good common sense. All right, this program has offered you the opportunity to learn more about underground line safety, overhead line safety, and safety when using electric power tools. Hopefully at this point, you have enough information to have a healthy fear and enough respect for electricity and the damage it can do when the rules for safety are violated. Of course, if you're interested, you can learn more about the hows, whys, and effects of electricity, but if you follow these safety guidelines, your increased awareness and respect will go a long way toward keeping you safe and making sure you get home each night. If you have questions or would just like more information about safety around electricity or anything else that involves your power company, contact American Electric Power. They're your power company and they have information and resources available to help you do your job safely. Thanks for watching.